Thanks for joining me for today's terminal webinar. We're going to give uh, a few more minutes for people to join this presentation. Um, by default, the audio is muted on your microphone. This is probably a good idea because we have so many people joining the, the conference. Um, at this time, if you don't mind, if your mic is unmuted, go ahead and mute it. During the uh, presentation, uh, if you have a question, just jot it down. I would like to go through uh, the various topics I'm going to cover today, and then towards the end of the seminar, we'll do some questions of, and answers. So first of all, I just would like to know if everybody can hear me. So if you can hear me, just nod your head. Thank you very much. And Celise, if you don't mind, I'd like you to just continue adding uh, viewers when they're in the uh, waiting room so that I don't have to focus on that. Can everybody see my screen, the Term Pro screen? Okay, perfect. So first of all, if you're already a Term Pro customer, I want to thank you for your business. Uh, today, I'm going to go through several different design scenarios and uh, show you, you know, some tricks that you may not know. One of the most important things to realize about the Term Pro software is that you should always work left to right. And the reason we do that is uh, if you work the other way around, you'll end up chasing your tail because anytime you make a change to your design, whether it's event change or anything that it checks uh, that affects the internal volume, it will by necessity change the dimensions that you've entered for the box. So there are some things you can do uh, to kind of get around that, and I'm gonna show you those things in a moment. When you first launch the Term Pro program, you come up to the driver library. The driver library has uh, some tabs across the top, and all of the drivers in the library are sorted alphabetically. So for instance, A, you'd find Alpine drivers, B, you know, whatever. Um, the program also gives you the ability to save favorites. Favorite drivers are the ones you use on a continuous basis, and they're not alphabetized. So whenever you look at, uh, at the driver library, and I'm sure that you guys that have this, uh, the software, you're already familiar with this. Let me see if I can just get this off of my screen. Okay. Today I'm going to start off with the driver that is just a generic woofer. Um, so I have this driver in the favorite folder. The, if you click on the save button right here, you'll see it's a driver that's called Mondo Base. This is only a 10 inch sub. And, uh, and I'm going to use that initially just because it's something that I'm pretty familiar with. Once you select a driver in the list of drivers, you'll see all the detail parameters that show up in this area right here. All of the fields that are in white are fields that are entered into the database for that specific driver. If you see a yellow uh, background, that means that the program has interpolated those values. So those values were not actually specified in the driver library, but the term lab, the term pro program actually will extrapolate that information and then fill in those fields. If you ever need to add a driver to the term pro library, I would recommend that you just enter these required parameters. So uh, if you look here, you'll see that there's the required parameters, there's like eight or 10 of those, and then there's a bunch of advanced parameters. The reality is that Term Pro probably does a better job of extrapolating this information than the manufacturers do at measuring it. So anyway, once you select the driver, you're gonna also see this bar graph down here. This is called efficiency bandwidth product. And the efficiency bandwidth product 
is an indicator that shows the driver's preference for a specific type of enclosure. So the further this little needle moves one way or the other, the more the driver prefers, for instance, a sealed enclosure or a vented enclosure. It doesn't mean that you have to follow those guidelines. This is just giving you an idea of what kind of, what the preference is that the driver has for the rear chamber of the enclosure. In this particular driver, uh, it's kind of close to the center, but leaning a little bit towards the sealed side. So this driver prefers a sealed enclosure, uh, but you can use it in any type of box you want. Once you select a driver, and, and I'll come back and show you how to add drivers in a, in a little bit, but let's go ahead and get through some designs first. So once you select the driver, the next step, moving left to right, is to click on Enclosure Design. So the Term Pro program supports 12 different types of enclosures. Um, there are two ways to select the enclosure you'd like to use. First, you can just use the left and right arrow keys to cycle through the various drivers. But another method is to actually click on the enclosure itself. And once you click on the enclosure, uh, you'll see this window pop up here. This window will show you the various types of enclosures. And one thing that's nice about this window is it shows you the advantages and disadvantages of each of the designs. So if you use Term Pro uh, on the sales floor and you do a consultation with the customer, this is kind of like a cheat sheet. So you can go through and say, okay, you know, what kind of music do you listen to? How loud do you listen to it? Um, and then, you know, the salesperson can say, well, you know, in the seal box, these are some of the advantages and, and so on. So in our first design, I'm going to just start off with a basic sealed enclosure. So if we click on the sealed enclosure, it'll select that box. And I always recommend that you start your design by clicking on one of these three profile buttons at the bottom of the screen. These buttons are called flat, normal, and boomer, and they represent the listening preference of the consumer or the person you're building the box for. This is just a starting point. Think of this as some as artificial intelligence. So if you click on flat, then the, then the software is going to design an enclosure with a maximally flat response. And um, if you click on one that's boomer, it's going to give you a system that has a, a little bit more of an enhanced base response. Before I go on any further, I want to show you some cool tricks um, with regards to using layers and seeing how the various um, plots work on the screen. So over here on the right hand side, you'll see this uh, area called layer control. You can think of that as like mylar sheet. So right now we're drawing on layer number one and it's visible. If I wanna compare this flat response to for instance, a boomer response and have both of those plots on the screen at the same time, I would go over here and click on layer number two. So now we're gonna draw on layer number two. And if I click on boomer, now I can actually compare those two graphs and you can see the difference. So for instance, in the boomer plot, it has significantly more base than the flat response, but it doesn't play as low as the, uh, as the maximally flat response. If you wanna turn off the grid down here on the bottom toolbar, there's a button that says grid, so I'm gonna go ahead and unclick that. I'm also gonna turn off power and displacement for a second. If you wanna see how uh, any particular measurement is done on the screen, you just move the mouse and click and hold the left mouse button. And as you move it left or right, you can view the uh, response characteristics on the right hand side where it says layer two cursors. So, you know, it shows you the current frequency and it shows you the relative response. So at 88 Hertz, that boomer enclosure will give you 1.8 dB more base than the uh, flat response. So if you want to hide that, you just take away the visibility button. You can go back over here and click number one to draw on that, or just click reset and that will reset everything. 
I'm gonna turn the grid back on. So anyway, um, back to the design. If you click on one of these uh, initial designs, for instance, normal, the program will calculate the required volume and it will show you the queue of the enclosure. You can make changes from there. So for instance, if we want to make this, uh, see how this looks in a half cubic foot box. If you, if you change that, to half a cubic foot, it will tell you what the new cue is and you will see in real time how it affects the frequency response of the system. So whenever you design an enclosure, there's two things you're trying to do. Uh, first of all, you wanna make sure that you have a system that is providing performance. Uh, obviously, that's why people want subwoofer systems in their vehicle. Uh, and then also you wanna make sure that you have a system that's reliable. So it's important that you talk to the customer and ask them what kind of sound, uh, you know, what kind of music they listen to and how loud they listen to it. That, that information will then help you select the type of enclosure you want to design. And I like to think of enclosures the same way as an artist thinks of color. So depending on the type of picture you're trying to paint, you select the best enclosure and driver to get the job done. And then the software will let you make changes to the design and see how that those changes will actually uh, impact the frequency response and the performance of the system. I wanna talk about power handling in a minute, but I'm gonna do that when we do a vented design. So anyway, on our design here, the seal box, the, once you click on one of these buttons, the program over here will tell you the rear volume requirement, what the cue of the enclosure is, and then it will tell you what the 3 dB down point is. The 3 dB down point is a reference point where the output of the system is down by 3 dB relative to the uh, pass band, this flat area here. Now it's important to note that most people can't even hear a 3 dB reduction in sound pressure level. Usually it takes 10 dB to sound about half as loud or twice as loud. So the 3 dB down point is just a reference point for us to use when comparing various types of enclosure. The other thing you'll see over here on the left is called dB ripple. This bar graph is, uh, indicates the deviation from a flat response. So if we did a flat enclosure, you'll see that the ripple is zero. There's no ripple. If I do a boomer, I'll see that my ripple is 1.83 dB. That's this hump right here. And you can validate that by using the cursor. And as I move it around, you'll see, you know, it's at 1.8 dB. So if you want a little bit of a bump, you're gonna always see something here in this ripple field. You just shouldn't try to get it over three or four dB, otherwise the system may not be very musical and it may not have good transient response. And when I say transient response, I mean that the system may sound, uh, it may ring. Uh, you may actually hear some uh, high frequency artifacts. The box, the bass won't sound very good or tight. So before I move on to uh, any other parts of the program, I'm gonna do a vented design. Once again, on the vented design, I like to start with a uh, profile button. That just gives you a starting point. So when I click on normal, the program tells me I need 1.9 cubic feet. And the 1.9 cubic feet is the net volume. That's the volume that the driver needs to see. So it doesn't include any bracing or port displacement or driver displacement. Those things are all added later on in the software. And then it tells you the box needs to be tuned to 28 hertz. So that's really pretty low. We really don't need, uh, a, you know, we really don't need a response that goes down quite that low. So there's two things you can do. You can either uh, reduce the box volume. So if I change this to say one and a half cubic feet, As soon as I do that, the program will show you the new response curve, and it also calculates the new recommended tuning frequency. So one thing you should also notice over here is uh, are these little padlocks. 
whenever you make a change to a parameter like the box volume, the program will turn on that little padlock. And it does that because it assumes that since you input that box volume, you don't want it to change. So it, it thinks that if I input a volume of 1.5 cubic foot, then uh, the program is assuming that you don't want that to change. And, and that's important because um, if you wanna misalign the box, like for instance, if I change the tuning frequency, the, the program is gonna leave that volume at 1.5 cubic feet. You can see as I change the tuning frequency, what it does to the response characteristics of the enclosure. If I had turned off this padlock, whenever you make a change to the tuning frequency, the program is going to try to, um, it's gonna calculate what it believes should be the best enclosure volume. So if you specify the volume, the program will calculate the tuning frequency. If you specify the tuning frequency, the program will calculate the volume. In this case, I have what's called a misaligned box. I have specified a rear volume of one and a half cubic feet and a tuning frequency of 35. I'm essentially sculpting this response to get something that I like. The hump is right around 50 Hertz, which is a great place uh, you know, to have a little bit of a bass bump. You have almost three dB of gain there. That means that at those frequencies, the amplifier will only have to work about half as hard to produce the same amount of output. And then when we look at the enclosure frequencies, it tells us that our 3 dB down point is at 37 Hertz. And this box has two and a half dB of ripple. So this looks like a pretty good design from the perspective of frequency response. But remember, there are two things we're trying to achieve when we design a box. Not only do we want good performance, but we also want to make sure that the system is reliable. And that's where we want to come over here and look at the power and displacement curves. And to make these more visible, I'm going to turn off the grid. So remember, the green line is our relative response. So I'm going to hide that. Now we're looking at power and cone displacement. This magenta line is showing cone displacement versus frequencies. So you can see at high frequencies over here on the right, there's almost no cone excursion. But as we go down in frequency, you'll start to see a rise in cone excursion. Then close to the tuning frequency, you'll have a um, reduction in cone excursion. In fact, at the tuning frequency, you'll have a, a null point. And then below the tuning frequency, you'll have a real rapid rise in cone excursion. Now, I don't think you guys can probably see this, but there's a real faint horizontal uh, line right here that's magenta. You can see where it starts is there's this dark magenta background on the, uh, on the scale field for excursion. And that thin magenta line is the X max of the driver. And the X max is the maximum one way linear excursion of the driver. So as we go down here, you can see at 26 Hertz, when you get below 26 Hertz, the driver is no longer in its linear range of operation. So the cone excursion is now exceeding the X max of the, of the driver. And that's an important point, and I'm gonna show you why. Up here on the top, you'll, there's another little thin yellow line, and this yellow line represents the maximum electrical power handling of the voice coil. So when it comes to power handling, there's, there are two types. There's electrical power handling, which is something that's controlled by the manufacturer. It's, it's simply the electrical power handling of the voice coil. If you run the speaker at, uh, at power levels in excess of that rated RMS power rating for extended periods of time, you'll burn up the voice coil. 
but there's also a mechanical power handling limitation and that's where the speaker exceeds the x max of the driver so in an ideal world and if you were to look at like a seal box most of them will have a dark yellow line that goes all the way across so this heavy yellow line is showing you the maximum amount of power that you can apply to the system without exceeding either the electrical or the mechanical power handling of the vo of the system so you can see like at higher frequencies and up here there's a, there's this field that says generator this defaults to the maximum rms power of the system so this speaker is a 150 watt speaker so at high frequencies it, the system can handle 150 watts but you notice once you get to this point right here 27 hertz when you go below 27 hertz that's where we start to see mechanically limited power handling that's because the speaker is exceeding the x max of the driver so if you look at the uh, where this happens you'll notice the correlation between the x max the magenta line and the power handling limitation so when the mechanical when the voice coil ex when the when the cone excursion exceeds the x max at the driver right here where the magenta line crosses the uh, maximum x max of the driver that's the same point where you start having these mechanical limitations so the program gives you some really powerful capabilities to uh, not only design enclosures, but also to see the, um, you know, the, how the reliability and power handling of the system is actually going to work for a given design. So once we're done with uh, the enclosure design, the next step is to go over and do the vent design. And the program will always initially default to a single three inch diameter pipe. Um, personally, I like pipes just because they're easy to work with and you can trim them very easily. It's a lot harder to uh, adjust the length of, for instance, a rectangular port. Um, in e either case, what we're dealing with here is the area of the port and the length of the port. So once you click on vent design, the program will show you that your net volume for the design is one and a half cubic foot and notice the little padlock there and the tuning frequency of the box is 35 hertz and both of those are locked because the program assumes that you don't want those things to change we're only going to use one port and you can change that right here where it says vent parameters you can change the quantity and then you have the internal vent dimensions and as I mentioned, the program just as a default will start it with a three inch diameter port. And it tells us that the length of the port needs to be 8.09 inches. When you look down here, uh, you'll see a little bar graph that says vent air velocity. And this is showing us the speed of the air inside the, the vent as a percentage of the speed of sound. Now, this is another subjective type display but you really need to pay attention to it your goal when you design an enclosure and then you go to vent it is to get this vent air velocity as low as you can and still fit the port inside the box and this is a challenge for uh for a lot of people in car audio because it's hard to tune a, a small enclosure to a low frequency and so the vent air velocity is directly related to the area of the vent. So right now with a three inch diameter port, our vent air velocity is over 10%. And I think that's too high. If the vent air velocity is really high, you can actually hear port turbulence. Um, also, if it gets really high, then the port may not even function correctly and the tuning frequency may be different or the tuning frequency may change depending on how loud you're playing the system. So, you know, when possible, you should try to get this vent air velocity as low as you possibly can. I'm gonna change the vent to four inches. And unfortunately, you know, when I change it to four inches, it tells me that the port needs to be 15 inches long. And so you just have to play with this until you can get uh, something that is going to work in, in your box. 
Now, when you have those situations where you just can't fit the port inside the box, um, there are two things you can do. You know, other than changing the area, um, number one, you can put an elbow on the port. So you could put like a right angle elbow in there and, and essentially bend the port at a 90 degree angle. Uh, when you do that, you want to measure the length of the port along the center line axis of the port. So right down the middle. The other option is if in some vehicles, uh, you can actually pull the port outside of the box, either all the way uh, or partially. And I'll show you in a little bit uh, when we do the wood design, how you would take that into account. For this design, I'm going to go ahead and put it back to three inches. It tells us that the vent length needs to be 8.09 inches and our port air velocity is 10.5%. Whenever you're looking at the 3D graphics, first of all, if you don't see 3D graphics on your program, that means you need to update the graphics driver uh, in your computer. So a while back, Intel uh, released a driver and it had a, a bug in it. And so it caused the 3D graphics not to work. They actually then have fixed the problem, and there's a link on the TurnPro website right on the home page where you can download that graphics driver update. The next thing I wanted to show you is you have these view setting control buttons over here on the right. Uh, this uh, allows you to manipulate the viewport so you can view it in different angles, rotate it around, you can animate it, uh, you can turn on the legend, which basically shows you, you know, what the dimensions are, like here's D for diameter and L for length. Okay, so once you have the port design, the next step is to go over and do your wood design. The first thing you need to do when you do a, uh, the wood design is you need to come down here and configure your, your settings for this. So if you click on the options to button down at the bottom, one thing you need to decide is, do you use these in-panel insets? So you not, might notice on this graphic here that the end panels are inset half an inch. And that's, uh, some people use that if they're covering the box with uh, carpeting or other covering material because you can roll it over those edges. Some, most people I would say probably don't do that. So you should change that to zero. Otherwise your dimensions are not gonna be correct. The other thing you need to do is specify the thickness of the wood you use. And a lot of people use like three quarter inch MDF. Uh, you can select MDF or even plywood. It doesn't affect the dimensions. I like to use plywood just because I like the, the graphical um, representation of plywood on the screen. Once you make those changes, if you want them to be permanent, you would come over here and from the pull down menu, you'd select file, save settings. And when you do that, uh, it saves those changes. And so the next time you do uh, a box, you're not gonna have to go in and change it. So once you go to wood design, over here on the left-hand side, you're gonna have these fields that represent the parameters of the design. The first one is called VB1. That's our rear enclosure volume. And there's a little padlock there. That's the net volume from our design of one and a half cubic foot. The program also knows that the driver displaces 0 0.067 cubic feet, and the vent that we just designed displaces 0 0.029 cubic feet. We don't have any bracing in this uh, enclosure, and so the total volume is 1.596 cubic feet. That's the total volume. The program is going to uh, come up with some arbitrary dimensions that represent a golden rule box. That's a box design that has minimum standing waves. That's just a starting point. So uh, you'd also probably want to turn on the legend so you know which panels you're looking at. Over here in the right, there's a little button that says legend. And then you would also want to decide if you want to make this a, a rectangular box, a wedge box. There's actually two different types of wedge boxes. I'm gonna just select this wedge one design. 
And when I do that, the program is going to come up again with uh, these golden rule in enclosure dimensions. Now, the software currently does not do a sanity check with regards to the, for instance, the driver diameter or the driver depth. It doesn't really know where you're going to put the speaker or, or the port. So you need to always keep in mind if you, in this case, with a 10 inch diameter woofer. So if we're going to put it on this front panel, you need to make sure that the panel is tall enough and wide enough to accommodate a 10 inch diameter driver. You would come in here and you would input your critical dimensions first. So if I want to make this box, um, 15 inches high, and I want the width to be, let's just say 24 inches. When you input those two critical dimensions, the software will calculate the two unknowns. In this case, it's uh, depth one and depth two. And you can control those also. So if I want, uh, you know, depth one to be 15 inches also, I can input that value and now the program tells me that the depth at the top needs to be 6.3. So as you input critical dimensions, the software will calculate the unknowns. It will also tell you the height of the face and then the angles that are required. Now, it's important that you look at how the enclosure is actually assembled uh, before you build it. There are these little check boxes that let you enable or dis disable the visibility for each panel. Like for instance, if I, if I turn off the top panel, I can see how it fits right inside of there. Now the, the way the box is actually constructed is designed to minimize acute or oblique angles uh, when you make your cuts. So you don't have these really uh, tiny angles that, that have, uh, you know, end up with a, the saw blade cutting two inches of wood. Really difficult to make cuts like that and keep them accurate. So the software is designed to keep those angles to a minimum. Once you're happy with the wood design, the next step is you come over here to the fabrication page. And the program will show you the blueprints for each of the panels you need to cut. So right now I'm looking at the top and it tells me in my dimensions, this is 24 inches wide by 5.075 inches tall. A really important thing to pay attention to are these letters at the end of each panel, A, B, C, and D. Those are your table saw blade angle indicators. So in the bottom right hand corner, it'll tell you what the table saw blade angles need to be in degrees. So cuts A and B, these two here are both at zero degrees, C is zero degrees, and D is 24.45 degrees. And then you can look at each of the panels in the design. Okay, so I'm going to skip back now. I showed you, that was just a very brief uh, instructional on how to design the enclosures. But a lot of times when you go and design an enclosure, uh, you go out to the car and you make measurements first. And so it's important that you do that before you begin. I'm going to show you some really cool tools now that will help you um, help you figure out um, how much space you have to work with. So let's go out, let's just go here. And let's say we're starting a new design. The first thing you do is you go out to the vehicle and you make your measurements. Then you wanna use this geometric calculator anywhere you see a little icon that has a calculator, it's, it's called a geometric calculator tool and it will calculate volumes for you. So you come over here and you select the type, the shape of the enclosure and then the thickness of the wood you want to use. You would then input the external dimensions that you have to work with. So let's say 15 inches high and let's say 12 inches at the bottom and you know, five inches at the top, and we can make it, let's say 30 inches wide. These are your maximum extents. 
When you input those dimensions, the program will show you the internal dimensions over here and it will tell you what the available volume is. So in this case, it's 1.541 cubic feet. Now that's the net volume, that's the maximum net volume you can achieve. So when you go through and design your enclosure, you wanna keep that number in the back of your head. But also remember, the port's gonna displace a little bit of, a, of air volume and the driver's gonna displace a little bit of air volume. So in our case, let's just assume that we can work with uh, 1.5 cubic feet. So we wanna make sure when we're designing our box over here, that this number does not exceed 1.5 cubic feet. As long as that number is less than 1.5 cubic feet, then we know that we can build a box and it will fit inside the, the vehicle's application. Then from there, you just move left to right. So the geometric tool is a, is a great way to calculate volumes of different shapes. And it also gives you a great starting point so that you can continue working left to right. If here, we get calls all the time where people will start on the wood design page. They input their dimensions here. Then when they go over here and start designing the enclosure, everything changes. Well, it has to change because if you do anything to the design, let's say the volume changes or the anything in the vent changes, make any kind of changes, it's going to, by definition, require changes to the, um, the wood dimensions in order to accommodate that enclosure. For those of you that are using uh, metric units, there's a button down here at the bottom on the toolbar that says metric. So when you click on metric, uh, the program will calculate all, will change all of the uh, dimensions into metric units. So now we're talking about centimeters. Now, whenever you're working with the software, it's really important that when, if the software is asking you for a number, you should hover the button over the mouse over the field and you'll see a ye little yellow pop-up that tells you exactly what the program is looking for. You should also look and see what the type of units are. Like in this case, VB1 is in liters. So the biggest mistake people make, um, especially when they do drivers, uh, entering drivers into the driver library, is they get the units mixed up. So let's, uh, let's input a driver so I can show you what I'm talking about. And by the way, you know, we're working on a new driver library update. Um, the last I heard, it's gonna have at least 10 new manufacturers in there. We've had a real tough time getting legitimate, real truthful uh, teal small parameters from a lot of the companies that sell speakers. In the old days, a lot of the companies made their own speakers. They had their own engineering departments and they, uh, they knew what these values were. Nowadays, a lot of companies, they don't make anything. They, they buy their stuff, uh, usually from China or South Korea, and they have to rely on the driver parameters that are specified by the manufacturer. Um, and sometimes those parameters are accurate and, and sometimes they're not. If you ever load a driver and you see a red field in, in one of these boxes, that means that the software doesn't believe it. And I've seen some really crazy stuff. Um, so we had to stop including a lot of the, the drivers with the software because it was, people were designing boxes based on information that was inadequate or incorrect. And so their results were not good. And we didn't want to include anything in the program that would cause us to you know, cause the customer to build something that doesn't work. One of the things uh, in the software that you may notice is that um, you cannot edit a driver that's included with our library. So if you want to edit a driver, you actually need to copy it and uh, the way you do that is you just select the driver and then down on the toolbar at the bottom, you click on copy. Then you can make your changes and then you click on save. 
And drivers that you input into the library have a white field in the background instead of a gray. To add a driver, you just click on the add button and then you input, I would recommend only the required parameters if you're inputting the driver. You can toggle back and forth between English and metric units by using this button down here. So once you input the driver, really make sure that all the information is accurate. You need to go back and make sure that uh, the volume and um, everything else is correct because for whatever reason, speaker manufacturers use a, a combination of English and metric units. So we have things like liters and cubic feet and inches and millimeters and centimeters, and it's really confusing. So after you input the data, you need to make sure that everything is correct. So I just got a note that I need to start doing some Q&A. Uh, in order for you to speak, you need to, the easiest way to do it is you just press and hold the space bar on your laptop and that acts like a walkie talkie. So as long as you're holding the space bar, I should be able to hear you. If you have questions or if you have a technical support question, I prefer that you call me after the meeting or, or send me an email. Let's just focus on uh, using the software or on enclosure design uh, techniques at this point. So at this, at this time, I'd like to open up the floor for any type of uh, questions that people may have. Okay, this is Jerome. And uh, my question is about um, port area when you're dealing with a pipe versus vent. I'm kind of experienced with the rectangular ports for figuring out the port area. Is there, can you give um, any advice when I wanna go to the pipe design about um, port area or is it just like follow the, um, the vent velocity um, thing, that's it? I would recommend that you follow the vent air velocity bar graph, but remember the vent air velocity is ba is making the assumption that you're applying full power to the driver. So a lot of times people are not playing the system at full power. Let's say you have a speaker that's rated for 5,000 watts. That vent air velocity calculation is going to show, is going to assume that you're applying the full 5,000 watts. If you, let's just say you have a speaker, let's do the one we just did. So if I go over here to enclosure design, the total applied power is 750 watts, which is the maximum rated power of the speaker. But let's say you're only gonna put, you know, 330 watts on that system. Maybe the amp doesn't produce any more than that. Now when you come to vent design, And let me input, I guess I need to design a box. Sorry guys, let's do it normal. You notice that the vent air velocity, I dropped that speaker down to 250 watts. Now the velocity is down to 8.99%. So um, there's really nothing you can do to fix it other than to make the port area as large as possible. But just keep in mind that the power affects this to a great degree. And sometimes in some systems, uh, if you know, at at full power, the system will be so loud that you won't be able to hear the port noise. But I try to keep it out of the red. Good morning. Um, I had a question. Uh, when we're doing the, the slot port, uh, a lot of times I, I do the bend on the port. Uh, does the software take into account any common walls when doing slot ports? It, that's a great question, and it does not do that right now. But in the next update, that's something that I want to add. So, um, yeah, the question for those of you who uh, who just you know who just tune in is when you do a slot port, which is like a special type of rectangular port, 
how does the software take into account adjacent walls? And right now it doesn't. Although you can still use uh, the rectangular port calculator and it's gonna be very, very close. I, as a rule of thumb, I like to keep the back of the port and any of the edges of the port at least half the port diameter away from any of those walls. So for instance, if you have a pipe that sticks into the box and it's three inch diameter pipe, I like to keep the back of the port at least one and a, one and a half inches away from the back wall. The same is true as if the pipe is, is mounted close to one side, I would I try to keep it at least one and a half inches away from the wall. You, if you put it directly up against uh, a, like the bottom of the, of the enclosure, the side of the enclosure, or any of the adjacent walls, it does have a little bit of an effect on the tuning frequency, but it's pretty negligible. So right now, it doesn't actually give you an exact uh, calculation to, you know, for, uh, for slotted ports that are adjacent to walls, but we've had a lot of people ask for that. So that's something that will be in the next update. Any more questions? Hey, this is uh, Juan. I am. I had a question uh, to see if is there any um, way to design for a T line enclosure in, in the software, or do we have to just rely on um, the loose math that's out there? Yeah. So transmission line is is like fifty percent science and fifty percent art, just like you kind of alluded to. We don't model it because there's not there are not any good algorithms that can definitively give accurate results 100% of the time. A lot of guys that do these types of enclosures, um, you know, they are craftsmen that just have experience and there's a lot of trial and error in getting it right. So, you know, if you do a box like that, it's funny you brought that up because the other day, Salee showed me a picture of a transmission line, you know, and I was, and, and, you know, it's complicated, uh, and, and she was wondering what it was. It's, it's uh, people that are into this kind of stuff like to build them, but it's, you know, it's just going to take some experience, and we don't have a way of modeling it. So I, I, don't, see, uh, I don't see that addition coming anytime soon. Got you. Yeah, I just spent a long time working on mine. I just finished it, but I understand. Thanks. Wayne, I've got one on layers. Yes, sir. All right. So you you didn't get into it, but you showed us a sealed box. You showed us ported enclosure. Um, in a sealed with with the software on both sealed and the vented enclosures, you can see relative response. You can see SPL. Now, if I work in layer one with a sealed enclosure, and then let's say I want I'm talking to the customer, and this is a great tool. I mean, I love using. I love using it with the customer because I can show them, okay, you want this, but I can take this enclosure or take this sub and design an enclosure and give you this. So as I'm jumping between layers, let's say I've got a sealed enclosure and then I jump to the vented enclosure on another layer. All of the information I entered on layer two for that vented enclosure, if I jump back to layer one, I can no longer see the enclosure size and the specifications I've entered. At the same time, if they want a ported enclosure and I suggest, say, a fourth order, when I do the fourth order, I can't, um, when I do the fourth order, I can't show them predicted SPL output because for some reason the software doesn't model that. It'll show it only if you cheat and you've got to cheat the software if you do layer two or layer one, and then you come after the fact and do a, a vented enclosure, you can hit SPL at the bottom of the screen and it will show for all the layers. Um, is there a way to get the software to remember what's going on as you click on each layer? So we're gonna compare sealed enclosure, vented enclosure, and a fourth order and see the information as we go back to each layer instead of it just kind of forgetting. That's exactly, that's a fabulous idea. It's actually on our wish list already, and I would expect that's going to be in the next update as well. So mm -hmm. it, it is a, a real limitation right now. You know, when you, right now you can graphically compare results, 
But when right. you switch back and forth, any of the changes that you use are actually lost. That, right. Believe it or not, that's a super simple change, and I'm not sure why it wasn't or isn't in the software already. Uh, with regards to the SPL thing, that's also another oversight. And I, I, someone called the other day, it may have been even you, I'm not sure who I was speaking with, and they brought that to my attention. And I, I kept trying to figure out why I couldn't turn on the SPL plot for bandpass enclosures. And there's, some, there's something uh, in the software that is probably a glitch or a bug that is keeping that, is making those buttons stay hidden. Um, before I take any more questions, I just, I got to show you, um, I need to show you uh, the bandpass thing because it's so powerful. Um, At the same time, Wayne, uh -huh. sixth, sixth order, I've never seen anything actually model a sixth order output correctly. Uh, why is that? Well, the sixth order boxes rely on those advanced parameters, and if they are not right, you're going to get really bizarre results. Um, that's another reason I suggest that you just input the, um, you can experiment with this on your own. So if you have a speaker that, that's giving you trouble when you do the sixth order design, I would make a copy of that driver and then go in and remove or delete all of those advanced parameters and then try the design on the copy and it will probably resolve your problem. So, one thing that's awesome about the bandpass box is I'll start with the fourth order box real quickly. Um, let me just select my driver. Again, you click on these three buttons down at the bottom, flat, normal, and boomer. And the program will design a, a box that has a given response. Now, whenever you do bandpass enclosures, you have this thing called gain bandwidth product. And the easiest way to think about this is imagine if you took like a, a two foot piece of wire and you held it at each end. The length of that wire is two feet. As you bring your hands closer together, the bandwidth, think of the width between your hands as the bandwidth. As you move your hands closer together, then the wire has to bow up. In other words, the gain goes up. So as you move your hands closer together, the gain goes up. As you move your hands further apart, the gain goes down. And that's the gain bandwidth product. And that's the easiest way that uh, you can visualize that. So if you start with a normal design, um, there are two things you can control. The gain bandwidth product, which is the width of the, band, of the response and the height and also the center frequency. So you use the Q and S values to control those things. S controls the center frequency. So if I wanna put the box at uh, you know, 50 hertz, I can do that. Down here, you'll see it says 50 hertz. And then I can use the S value to adjust the shape of the response. So in this case, you know, if I want a flat response, and I want it centered at 50 hertz, it's that easy to do. And it tells me what my box frequencies are, the center frequency, and you can see that you have about 1.6 dB of gain here. You really won't want to use a bandpass. The best, the, the main advantage of a bandpass box is it can give you additional gain, um, but you have to be careful. If you design a box that, that is too peaky, um, then you'll end up with something that sounds like somebody's beating on the bottom of a trash can. So it's like one, like for instance, this design here, it has 6 dB of gain at 50 hertz. But as you move away from 60 hertz, the output drops off significantly. So what will happen is as the music moves into the pass band, the bass will get really loud. But on either side of that, it will be, uh, you know, it won't sound so good. Okay, so I'll, ask, I'll bring it back up so you guys can uh, ask some more questions. Uh, Wayne? One question, uh, Wayne. Yes. Yes? Yes. Um, I wanted to know as far as does the program take to account for like 45 degree angles in a box or any sort of like supporting um, holes or anything like that? For you guys that use the old, really old, old, old version of the term pack program, uh, when you do wedged enclosures, you could actually specify 
the front panel angle and the program would calculate the dimensions. Somewhere along the way, that feature was lost. And our friends in South Africa uh, use that continuously. They use a, a tool to go out and measure the seat uh, and figure out that. So that, that feature, the software doesn't currently support uh, the ability to specify the angle and then it will calculate the dimensions, but it is uh, again on the wish list. Um, and then you had another question. I forgot what the second question was. What was it? Really, basically, any supporting poles, like if you were to have them internally, like uh, bracing. There you go. That's the word I was looking for. Sorry. Yeah, so you can do bracing. Um, let me share this. Okay, when you're doing your wood design, there's a field here that, um, let me go ahead. You have your design volume for the back chamber and the front chamber. Let me just do something simple to minimize in, you know, it just makes it simpler to make it simple like this. Okay. So you have your design volume, your driver displacement, and your bracing displacement. By default, it's normally zero, but if you wanna put in bracing, the easiest way to do it is you click on this little geometric calculator tool. And then you, let's, if you put in a two by four, you just input like the, uh, you know, whatever the height of your box is, you have to punch in these numbers. So you put them in like uh, one and a half by three and a half, and then the height, and then you can actually click the apply button. Let's see the height. I'm not validating this information is correct, but you'll at least get the idea. Let's say it's, uh, so it tells me what the volume of that bracing is. If I click on apply, it punches it right over here into the, uh, into the bracing displacement field. And then it tells you your total, total cubic feet. If the bracing is small, you probably don't even need to worry about dealing with it because Box volume variations of un, of 20% or so don't really have any significant impact on the on the response characteristics of the system. The other thing is uh, something as small as this brace is probably well in the noise floor. It's actually in the, the the manufacturing tolerances of the loudspeaker itself probably generate more error than the bracing would. But that's how you do it. Next Wayne, question. Wayne, you mentioned, uh, uh, Wayne, earlier you mentioned if you take a port slightly out of the enclosure, you would show us how to uh, add for that in the timber design. Perfect. Yeah, sorry I forgot to do that. So what you would do is first you have to design one. So when you come over to wood design, you'll see your design volume, driver displacement, and vent displacement. So that vent is, uh, if it's 10.5 inches long, and you want four inches to come out of the port, I mean, to be out of the box. So let's say you want the port, you want to take four inches from the inside and actually put it on the outside of the enclosure. You need to change that uh, vent displacement slightly. So you have 0 0.04 cubic feet. You need to come over here and if you click on cylinder 
and we make it three inches in diameter and four inches long, okay, the volume is 0 0.016. That's how much we're gonna take away. So you need to subtract 0 0.016 from 0 0.04. So it would be like, what is it, 0 0.024? It's what the vent displacement becomes up here. So does that make sense to you? You're just taking whatever the displacement is that you're removing, you have to subtract it out of that vent displacement field uh, on wood design. Sid, did that answer your question? Yes, Okay. thank you, 100%. Okay. Next question. Wayne, how are you doing? How are you doing, Sleece? Hey, I'm great. Excellent. Uh, in fact, I had four questions, three of them which have already been answered. The one was the slot vent option, which is something we've managed to work around, but it's nice to know that it might be coming on the wish list. Um, one of the things that was a really great feature back in the old days was the cost calculator, because it was a great selling tool when uh, consumers came into retail stores that have term prep on their front counter, they would show them a box option and then they would be able to work out pretty accurately with obviously sending in the information what the cost would be. Is that a tool that could be reintroduced because it's a really good selling point for the program and also for retail guys who obviously are trying to um, you know, encourage people to build a correct enclosure? So here's what I would like to ask each of you to do. Um, my email is wharris at termpro.com. And if you have something that you want to be added to the wish list, send me an email and try to be as clear as you can. Some of these features, I'm not sure how they got lost. Uh, more than likely, I was in the process of porting it and then I got sidetracked or distracted and then I just never went back and did it. So um, if there are things that are missing that you, that you would like to see, be sure and send me an email. And if there are other ideas that you have, uh, you know, be sure and include those too. And don't assume that we know what you want at this point. So uh, my email is wharris at termpro.com and I'll do my best to add those in the next update. How hard would it be to add a feature where we can save the designs? That's actually the number one feature that's coming. That's the number one. That, that is the number one thing that this next update is going to include, is, is the ability to save and load uh, designs. It's actually a little more complicated than it sounds because uh, we use a driver library, and manufacturers change the specs, but they don't change the name. So you have a speaker and you buy it in December and then you buy it in you know March and it has exactly the same name but the driver parameters are different and so we need to embed the actual driver parameters need for the speaker need to be embedded into the design of the enclosure that you say so it's not the way that I would have would like to do it but that's the reality so uh, but that is definitely coming for sure Next question. Hey Wayne, I got a question for you. Yes, sir. Uh, just curiosity on the the custom drivers. Like I'm I'm working with custom drivers, uh, like the bigger sundowns, FIs, things like that. When I go to plug it in and I do a boomer or just a normal flat, to me the the volume is way low. Um, a lot of these are calling for four, four cubes, three cubes, five cubes. And then when I put it into the uh, computer and when I put it into yours, you're calling for a cube and a half or two cubes on some of them. Is it, am I am putting in the wrong specifications or is it just custom enclosure? I'm just going to have to just kind of tweak it myself. I, my guess is there's probably a mistake in the uh, in the teal small parameters that are being input. It's so easy 
to get like the VAS or something. It, those things, a little bit of a change there, <coughs> excuse me, can make a big difference in the design. But why don't you send me the driver parameters that you're trying to do? And I believe Sundown's gonna be in our next driver library update, actually. Um, so, uh, but email me and I'll take a look at it. So the, the one thing I also wanted to tell you guys, you just made me think of this, Scott. Whenever you specify the number of drivers, so let me go back over and share this real quick. When you're doing your enclosure design, there's a place here where it says driver configuration and it has the quantity. If you hover that mouse over that field, it says the number of drivers that share a common back chamber volume. So if you're gonna put two, in, two subs in a enclosure and they're sharing a common rear volume, then you would change that to two. But if you're doing two drivers and there's a partition between them, essentially, <coughs> excuse me, um, that is not gonna work correctly. You're gonna get invalid results. If you need to do it that way, I would suggest that you just select you change the number, the quantity to two and design a common volume for two speakers and then you just uh, insert the, the baffle in between. The other thing um, is with regard to bandpass boxes, this one's really confusing. <coughs> Sorry guys, not in th this quarantine thing, I haven't talked to anybody in a month. So um, if you come over and you do like a, a uh, one of these kind of boxes. Okay. Obviously, there are two speakers in this enclosure, but the number of drivers is the number of drivers that share a common back chamber. So in this configuration, you would still leave the driver configuration as one. It's just a special enclosure design where you have one speaker on this side and a mirror image on the other. So that's where people get confused a lot uh, on these three chambered boxes. So now if you had four total drivers, two on each side, then the number of drivers would be two. Real, real quick question on that, Wayne, just what you were saying. If we're doing something along that lines and we have separate drivers and say we're doing a two to one box do in the program, do we need to double that center section? Does that make sense? You don't need, the program will uh, do all of that for you automatically. So if you do a, a design, just like I showed you, where there's one speaker on either in on each side, uh, those volumes will all be calculated correctly. If there are two speakers on each side and you change the quantity to two, then it will still, everything will be calculated correctly. You don't need to, mentally double or have anything. The program's going to tell you how to do it. I think what he's asking, Wayne, is if he wants a two to one ratio and he's got, say, two cubes per sealed chamber, should he go four cubes or eight cubes in the in the center in the common vented? I think that's what Scott's asking. If he wants a two to one ratio enclosure, if he's got two cubes per sealed chamber, should he go with uh, will, it, will the software say, okay, because you can't tell the software, I want a two to one ratio, I want a three to one ratio. You know, you can't tell the software what kind of ratio you're looking for because the SPL guys are, you know, they're a different breed. So, well, you can manual, you can manually control it. So like if I design this box right here uh, that has this, you know, it's a bandpass enclosure. Are you talking about a three chambered or uh, just a standard, say fourth order box? Uh, like the the, the tri-chamber, if I'm doing one, say the sealed portion, I'm doing two cubes. So each side's gonna, each side sealed is gonna be two cubes. Do I need in the program, is it going to know that, that and I'm doing it a two to one, is it going to know that the, I've got two cubes in the center, it's gonna be uh, basically eight cubes, correct? Two, eight, and two. So that would be a two to one, or no? Two, four, and two. Two, four, and two, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think so that. you can do that. I mean, so normally, like what I did, it depends on what kind of frequency response you're looking for. So 
right now I input a volume of two cubic feet, which is the outside volumes, two, and then two on the outside. And the program thinks for this design that it, the center should be 2.29, but you can specify four there and that's what you're going to get. I mean, I can see why an SPL guy would want to do that because, you know, you got this big peak, uh, you know, almost 4 dB right there. So you can manually, uh, it, the ratios are what they are, and but you have control over those if you want to manually specify the box volumes. Wayne, I think his question there was in that, that situation where you have two sealed chambers, the software, if he wanted to get a two to one ratio out of the enclosure, two to one with a regular fourth order is simple, two chambers. But if he wanted to get a two to one ratio, would he double the, the center chamber volume, the common vent with one side, or would he have to double it with both sides? No, you'd have to double it for both sides. So what you really got here to get two to one, uh, you've got two and two. The outside volumes are four cubic feet total. So the center would have to be eight cubic feet. And, you know, and you can see that it's uh, pretty peaky. Yeah. But that's how you would do it. You can get any kind of ratio you want, but you have to sum those outside. It's because the ratio, the ratio, the way you're, you guys are talking about it, it's the ratio of the total center chamber volume to the total outer chamber volume. So you have to, in this case, you know, it'd be two plus two is four. That's the, the, the total outside volume is four cubic feet. And if you want the inside to be twice as large, it would be twice that or eight cubic feet. So Scott, you'd be a one-to-one -one if you had a four cube center chamber. That's correct. Gotcha, yep, okay. Uh, Wayne, on that question of doubling uh, with isobaric, um, understandably, the enclosure always sees half the space of one. So when you enter one, obviously it says it's seeing only the chamber, but it's actually working as one speaker. So how does the computer calculate that volume? So when you do isobarics, the program thinks of those two drivers as a drive unit. So if you specify one, the program is assuming it's two drive unit, I mean, two speakers that make one drive unit. So um, it would, even though there's two physical speakers, you would still select the driver uh, configuration to be one. Okay, that makes sense. Because a lot of the time people get confused and uh, I'm glad you cleared that up because obviously it does change the volume dramatically. Yeah, and so, it actually will make the volume about half of what, so, you know, like in this case, uh, an isobaric for this driver sealed box um, is point, I forget which one I push. So it's 0.336. If I make it sealed, it's 0.672. So it makes it half because it's, uh, you know, when you put the drivers face to face like that, it cuts it in half. Any other questions? I have one more question about the um, um, the ports on the round ports, and when you double it up in the um, with the length, does each port have to be what the program tells you in length, or yes. is that total length? Thank no, you. that's right. So each each port. So if you have two ports that are three inches in diameter. Uh, and it's the program, the length says 10 inches, then both of those ports need to be 10 inches. Okay, is it, if there's nothing else, um, any anything else? And then if not, I'm gonna, there should be a short five question, yes, no survey at the end of this. I'd appreciate it if you just fill it out. Um, this is the first time I've, do, I've done one of these, so uh, you know I'll try harder in the future. But I do appreciate you guys stopping by here. And uh, again, thanks for your business. Um, with the uh, 
right now there's nothing going on in DB Drag Racing because we're pretty much not able to do any shows. So we've been focusing on things like training and training seminars and software updates and things like that. So uh, don't forget to email me your suggestions or ideas or wish list items, and I will try to incorporate those into the next update. And I want to say hi to everybody and, and welcome all of our international guys that came in. We've got Benny in Slovenia is there. Hi, Benny. And um, we've got all the South African guys and some of the European and the UK guys. It's awesome to see everybody. Yeah, really great. Hey, Wayne, one question. Are you planning to do any of these, um, like, trainings on DB Drag through this, um, through Zoom? Uh, on training, like, for the judges or for the competitors? Um, I guess both, because uh, I've never competed. I have um, been to one show or so, but I would like to get into it, but I have no idea where to start besides the documentation that's online. So... This product here called Zoom is really amazing and easy. And, you know, I would expect that you're going to see a lot more coming from us. For you guys that don't know, um, I'm actually working on my PhD in, distant, in, in, in educational technology. So I uh, have been working really hard on developing some training modules for Term Lab, and I've been focusing really exclusively on the template, the mechanism, the underlying machine that makes it work. Um, once I have that nailed, then I'm going to be producing a lot of training modules for Term Lab initially, uh, because that product is so sophisticated, and even the people that have been using it forever don't even know the tip of the iceberg. And, you know, we haven't done a good job of explaining all of its capabilities. So that's, that's one of my big focus areas. Uh, in DB Drag Racing, uh, we already have a bunch of training that goes on with regards to the judges. So the judges uh, communicate, and we work elbow to elbow at shows, uh, you know, learning how to be more consistent in applying the rules. I'm not sure that we're going to do any uh, formalized training for the judges. We may do some roundtables like this that are between the judges. As far as the competitors go, just so you know, we held our first DBDRA happy hour last week. And it was just an opportunity for anyone that's interested in DB drag racing to drop in, say hello, ask questions, make comments, suggestions, or just to stay engaged. Because right now, you know, everybody's locked up. A lot of people are working on their builds, but Sometimes it's nice to see a friendly face. I know that I really enjoy seeing you guys here and uh, visiting with um, the people that we'd normally be seeing at shows. So if you'll watch our website, I think the next, uh, I'm not sure when the next DBDRA happy hour is. It's, I've lost all track of time. It's probably next week. Do you remember, Salise? Is it? It's like every two weeks. So. I am totally in a black hole. I don't know what day it is. And, you know, this whole thing has got me messed up. But, um, you know, you're welcome. And we'll announce it on the website when, it, when we know that time. Well, that's all I have for now, guys. We'll do this again if you like. Uh, in fact, if you have specific areas or topics that you'd like to see addressed in the future, um, include those in your emails. And, and the next time we do a training seminar like this, uh, I'll try to focus on those areas where you're interested. Well, thanks again for coming. And I will see you next time. Don't forget to fill out that survey if you, if you don't mind. Wayne, where do we see the survey? It should pop up at the end of this. Uh, at the end of this, I'm not for sure. Um, they didn't tell me how that worked, but I created a survey and it said that the attendees would have the option to fill it in at the end of the meeting. Cool, thanks. But if it doesn't, no big deal.
Thanks a lot. You guys have a good one and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wayne. Thank you, Cities. Thank, Thank you. you.